and verses 1 to 23. Remember what we've been looking at here, guys, is that we're at, God is answering the question of verse 3. So have a look in verse 3 again of chapter 7. This is the question that uh, produces this response from God that goes throughout chapter 7 and chapter 8. The question from Bethel is, now that the temple is nearly complete, should I mourn and fast in the fifth month as I have done for so many years? And God is continuing to answer that question as we go into chapter 8. The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I'm very jealous for Zion. I'm burning with jealousy for her. And this is what the Lord says. I will return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. And then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. And the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with cane in hand because of their age. And the city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. This is what the Lord Almighty says. It may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at that time, but will it seem marvelous to me, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I will bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Now hear these words. Let your hands be strong so that the temple may be built. This is also what the prophets said who were present when the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord Almighty. Before that time, there were no wages for people or hire for animals. No one could go about their business safely because of their enemies, since I had turned everyone against their neighbor. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as I did in the past, declares the Lord Almighty. The seed will grow well. And the vine will yield its fruit. The ground will produce its crops and the heavens will drop their dew. I will give all these things as an inheritance to the remnant of this people. And just as you, Judah, and Israel have been a curse among the nations, so I will save you and you will be a blessing. Do not be afraid, but let your hands be strong. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Just as I had determined to bring disaster on you and showed no pity when your ancestors angered me, says the Lord Almighty, so now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other. Render true and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other. Do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The fasts of the fourth, fifth, seventh and tenth months will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for Judah. Therefore, love, truth and peace. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come and the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, Let us go with you, because we've heard that God is with you. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. What to do with remembrance. What to do with remembrance. I suppose for the past number of years, as we approach this time of year, I've looked up online, you know, the numbers. The numbers who died in their youth defending their countries. In World War I, 11 million military personnel died. Up to 40 million people died, including uh, civilians. 40 million in four years. And that's not including the Spanish flu, obviously. World War II, 20 million people, or military personnel died. 20 million. 
up to 85 million, including civilians. And we know of the troubles in this part of the world as well, uh, and the people that died as well in that time. It's a somber day, isn't it, when we think about these things, and we think about the things that have disturbed us even yesterday, and the unrest in London. What do we do with remembrance? Well, you see, surprisingly for many, the Bible is always rele relevant to uh, human experience. And in fact, this passage that we're looking at this morning, again, uh, timely as it is under God's purposes and, and will. I didn't know we would be coming up with this passage, but it is actually a passage that deals with the subject of remembrance. It's dealing with uh, the remembrance that God's people were a part of at that time when for 70 years now they were remembering the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple which involved this annual fast. It's two years now after Zechariah's visions and as we look into chapters 7 and 8 we read that God spoke to Zechariah again but this time God doesn't speak in visions. God is answering a question that was asked by the people of Bethel. Now, Bethel was this major city. I hope you can make that out. There's uh, Jerusalem in green, and Bethel is about 10 miles uh, north of Jerusalem. Uh, so it was this major city. It was where Abraham set up an altar to worship the Lord. It was where Jacob had his dream of the stairway to heaven. It was where Elijah heard through the prophets there that God was going to take him home. Yet, Bethel, tragically... With the apostasy of Israel, God's old covenant people, Bethel became a place of idolatry when Israel became two divided kingdoms after King Solomon. And the prophets and the kings set up altars to the idols of neighboring nations. And so Bethel became this offensive city to God as it turned into really an ancient idol worship center. But now, word had got out about the revival in Jerusalem, about the Lord's completed temple there. And so the people of Bethel had a question, which we see in verse 3 of chapter 7, in response to the good news that God's temple was being finished in Jerusalem. And it seems a fairly little question really you could say what was it well the question was whether the people of Bethel who were separated from the people of Jerusalem because of this border of the divided kingdom between Judah and ancient Israel now and the question was whether they should continue the practice of weeping of remembrance of fasting every fifth month of the year. You see, every fifth month would be marked for 70 years at this stage as the annual remembrance of the destruction of the Jerusalem temple under Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And it's been 70 years now, so it's become a tradition, you could say. And they wondered whether they should continue to commemorate the temple's destruction in this way simply because the temple was nearly rebuilt and Jerusalem was looking up. And so the Lord uses Zechariah to answer this question and he answers it in four different ways as we go through the rest of this passage. God provides us with this big answer. It continues on into chapter 8. But we'll have a look at that in a moment. The first part of God's answer, though, is in verses 4 to 7, if you look there. Fasting, you see, was always an expression of personal or national repentance. It was twinned with coming back to God as a person realized their sinfulness and brokenness and they turned back to God. In the Old Testament, it was usually, uh, it, that was what fasting was understood as being, was within this context of turning back to God. Joel chapter 2 and verse 12 says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. And only once did God command an annual remembrance fast, which of course is the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. 
But this fast that they'd been observing for some 70 years, they'd actually put in place themselves. God had not ordered this fast. And worse still, God saw this fast as something they were doing for themselves without any reference to him, which we see in verses uh, 5 and 6. God asks them, well, when you fast and mourn in the fifth and seven months for the past 70 years, was it really for me you fasted? God is asking. And verse 7 then sums up God's displeasure at this question that the Bethel people are asking. You see, this fast, it wasn't instructed by God. It could have been avoided, in fact, if the previous generations of Israel had listened to the preaching of the prophets. Had resolved to obey God's word and God's commands. Repentance could have prevented the need for this fast. And so God's first answer to this question of verse 3, of con- whether to continue this fast, was essentially this. What's the point to this fast anyway, by the way, says God? I didn't order it. And it was never for me in the first place. You see, God is never happy when his people just introduce empty rituals in his church with the bells and smells of tradition, God isn't pleased. Uh, God continues to answer, though, in verses uh, 8 to 10 as well. Uh, God's second answer lays out what God demands of his people and his demands that were ignored by the previous generations, which actually resulted in the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem, for which they were fasting. He demands that they come to him. You see, God's point is clear. He's not a fan of empty-headed rituals amongst his people. God wants us to actually live with him, to live lives of obedience before him. Obedience is better than any bell or smell, says God. And we can see in verses 9 and 10 that expected, he expected his people then to simply to walk with him, to obey his commands. And God calls us in Christ today then, just as he called his people in the old covenant, to love each other. To love one another's neighbor as yourself, to show fairness, to be loyal, to be kind. And express compassion for others. We see all of that in verse 9. This is what God wants. Not some kind of ritualistic fast. He calls us to care for those who don't care for themselves. Verse 10. He forbids us to plot and to scheme against each other. Which tragically can happen in the church. How we love others shows how we love God, after all. You see, the problem, as we go into 11 to 14 of chapter 7, the problem with that previous generation that produced God's anger and destruction of Jerusalem was very simple. That previous generation of God's people simply didn't obey God's commands. They rejected the covenant, tragically. They rejected his commands and they rejected the preaching of the prophets who were continually trying to call them back to the covenant. But they rejected God. See that in verse 12? They made their hearts as hard as flint and wouldn't listen to the law or to the words that the Lord Almighty had sent by his spirit through the earlier prophets. So the Lord Almighty was very angry. And so, tragically, this annual fast that they instituted was actually because of their previous generation's rejection of God, rejection of his word, rejection of his commands. And so in God's wrath, God destroyed them. 
He scattered them amongst the nations, as we read in verse 14. And so God then, back to this time of rebuilding the temple and the question that's been asked in verse 3, God expected this current generation of his people to learn the lessons of the past, not to fall into pointless rituals for genuine obedience to the law. This fast, you see, it was just this empty-headed ritual. And so God reminds us, Mullock Mean Baptist Church today, his new covenant people today, those of us who say we are in Christ, that we're to walk with him in the present, that we're to seek to obey him. And Christ commands who we've been made perfect through as we identify with the one who obey God's commands perfectly. God doesn't want us to descend into some kind of Christian ritual in this church. God is interested in having a relationship with you, not in you observing Christian ritual and tradition. God wants you to walk with him every day, to love him and and to love Jesus well, which means obeying him. You know what Jesus says in John's Gospel, if you love me, keep my commands. Not observe this ritual and that ritual and that commemoration and this commemoration, good as they can be, that is not where we find a relationship with the living God. We go on, don't we? Into chapter 8. And we see here that things are moving rapidly now. As this is a prophecy, it begins to look forward now. He, God has given a reason as to why this uh, fasting is kind of pointless because they've missed the point of what happened 70 years previously when the place was destroyed. And now he's looking forward with his people and is saying, well, actually, there'll be no fasting. Things are going to turn from fasting into feasting. And so we have these two final answers in chapter 8. And they turn attention away from the fast causing circumstances that God's people were living with in those days. To a time when devastation would give way to comfort and prosperity. There are some remarkable verses in chapter 8, aren't there? I love... Um, those uh, verses, uh, verses 4 and 5. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with the cane in hand because of their age. Now, I know some of you, one of whom I live with, has a cane, has a walking stick. And that's a blessing, you know, because that shows God's blessing uh, for a long life, you know, a, a life well lived. But actually what that's pointing to is eternal life. It's saying, you know, that we're going to live eternally, uh, depicted by this idea of the old person with the stick. And we also see this lovely scene in verse 5. You see it? The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. No sign of war. No sign of neighborhood tensions and ghettoized communities firing rocks at each other or whatever it is. It's the opposite. It's a wonderful picture Is it not of heaven itself? See, God is describing a setting for God's people that in those days would have seemed impossible to them. Just too good to be true. It was such a divided and complex society. Even Jerusalem itself, with the building of the temple, there were enemy neighborhoods in Jerusalem. Just as there are today, you could say. But chapter 8 paints a picture of God's heavenly blessing for his people. And as we see in chapter 8, this blessing would include the Lord's presence and uh, uh, worship of him. All in peace and all in prosperity. Look at 11 and 12 of chapter 8. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as I did in the past, declares the Lord Almighty. The seed will grow well. What a peaceful word to farmers. Of arable land at least. The vine will yield its fruit. There'll be no debate. It's going to happen. The ground will produce its crops. And the heavens will drop their dew. I will give all these things as an inheritance to the remnant of my people. Just having a look then in verses 1 to 8. The question is, do they still need to fast? Fast. Fast. 
asked the men from Bethel way back at the beginning of chapter 7. But all we see in verses 1 to 8 is this picture of blessing, layered blessing on top of layered blessing, blessing upon blessing. And it's so wonderful, that scene in verses 1 to 8, that, that they may have really had doubt amongst the people about, could this really happen? And for us, well, these words remind us that our saving faith in Christ is only the beginning of the blessings that God has in store for us. And we might find all of this hard to believe, says God, but look at verse 6, believe it, says God. Because I'm doing it, not you. I'm going to provide this blessing, says the Lord of Lords, says the Lord of Armies, the Lord Almighty, who has this world at his disposal. He will carry out his eternal purposes for his eternal people. There'll be no fasting there. You know that word in verse 6, marvelous. Well, that word marvelous, it, it means difficult or beyond one's power. It, it's this stunning reality that God is going to do something that we know is impossible. It points to God's extraordinary and miraculous acts. And what was humanly impossible to accomplish then was not in any way beyond God's capability. Nothing is too hard for the Lord, friends. Indeed, nothing is hard for him at all. And so we're in a safe place if we're in Christ in this world. With all the things that cause us concern, with all the things that leave us feeling frightened and powerless, we're in a good place with God, even in this tumultuous world. Our prospects are marvellous in him. And look at verses 9 to 17 then. And we see this contrast now between what was and what we can see is coming. What life was like and what the world is like for us today indeed. But what is going to be, uh, the, what is go, it's going to be like for those who repent and believe in Christ. And it can all become our incentive then to proper living set out in God's commandments. Sadness and fighting, see verses 10 to 12, sadness and fighting would be replaced with peace and prosperity. Curse for sin would turn to blessing in Christ, verse 13. God's punishing anger will give way to his grace and blessing, verses 14 and 15. And yes, maybe that current generation would not experience the fullness of God's blessing. The fullness of this feasting instead of fasting. But the certainty of God's promises of blessing could motivate the people in those days to obedience to God's commands and to keep building the temple. And if they could be motivated to do that in those days, 500 years before Jesus came, so can we. Are we the Lord's people? Are we really? Are we his people today in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because if we are, we can be working collectively towards the blessings of heaven and our eternal reward described here in chapter 8 to all of God's people in the earth. Cross all time. Are we willing then to get out the bunkers of our homes and reach out and build God's temple. It's a temple of living stones now. In fact the Jerusalem temple was always only pointing to the reality of the temple today. Which is made up of souls. Which is made up of young children next week hearing the gospel and maybe responding in faith. Are we motivated to get on with the building? God's eternal temple, just as Zechariah's sermons given to him by God were to motivate the people then to build this physical temple where Christ would cry out 500 years later as we saw last Wednesday in John 7 after the festival week in Jerusalem when the water was being carried to the temple every day as they remembered God's provision for them in the wilderness. Jesus says, I am that water. I am the living water. And whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within me, within them. 
Are we motivated to be a blessing to others as those who know that we've been blessed by him? How can I be a blessing to others? What building program, what part of the building program should I be in? Chapter 8 is powerful stuff, friends. And the call on our lives as well is not just being involved in this building program, but it is about being faithful and honest in our characters. That's what God wants. He doesn't want ritual. He wants ethics. He wants a style of living amongst his people that becomes the bedrock of our witness as we continue on with the building. Look at verse 16 and 17. This is what God calls us to be. These are the things that you're to do. Speak the truth. No surprise, is there? Speak the truth to each other. Don't be playing silly ritual Christian games on Sunday mornings over coffee. Be honest. Tell people about the things you struggle with. And have the grace to have confidence with each other. That you're not gossiping. But supporting each other as Christians. Being discreet in our support and our love of each other. These are the things, verse 16, you're to do. Speak the truth to each other. Render true and sound judgment in your courts. Don't plot evil against each other. That's as simple as slandering somebody. That's as simple as you hearing some tasty morsel in this place from somebody else about them. And you go and tell somebody else. We need to be careful with each other if we're to love one, each other. Do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. You see, for God, it's all about our service in the rebuilding of his temple. And for us to do that, we need clean living. We need faithful service to him. That is what God wants, not pointless rituals that many churches have become of course there was no reason to keep the fast says God and so we're left then with these wonderful promises at the end of uh, at the end of chapter 8 see verses 18 to 23 we'll have a look there because we see the word of the Lord coming to Zechariah again here and we see blessings to the Jewish people as well as to us the Gentiles as we come together in this fullest sense of God's people at the end of history, his eternal church, the change at some point from fasting to feasting will be so utter, it will be so dramatic, it will be from fasting to cheerful feasting, filled, verse 19, with joy and gladness. There will be joy instead of mourning. Verse 21, have a look there. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let's go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I'm going. This true worship of God will be contagious. It will cross borders and continents. So attractive will God's blessing be, God inspires Zechariah to preach, that all nations will seek the Lord and join in true worship. And so we see it in verse 22 and 23, and there we are. That's where we are. We're in those verses. Many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty, to entreat him. And this is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, ten people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you, because we have heard that God is with you. I can't speak Aramaic. I can't speak Hebrew. I don't have the language of Greek. And so we're on the periphery in a way. To all that God, God has been doing in the world throughout history. We're not the people of this time. And we're not the people of Jesus' earthly language. But what we read in these verses is God is bringing people like us. From an alien place. From an alien language. Into his very presence. Isn't that marvelous? We can say then that the church is that reality in our world today. Even with. The problems in the church. People are coming to Christ. 
And even in our church, people are potentially all the time coming to Christ in simple little ways. We might feel with Nigel and me out in the prison in the week with three men there. And with the amazing journeys here this week and with the prison ministries which keep going uh, throughout the week and on next Tuesday night. When men caught in their sins find freedom in Christ. When young people this very weekend past have heard of the only way to God through the service of this church today. It's all there in verse 23. You see there that idea of ten men from every language group and nations grasping hold onto every Jewish person. It's a picture then of this massive number that will worship the one true and living God. <laughs> and we worry about wars. And we worry about people movements. And we worry about what our nation's becoming. God's building his nation through the mess of it all. It's a wonderful prophecy we're left with of our inclusion in God's kingdom, his church, and the worldwide expansion of God's kingdom that is happening now as we sit here. And remember here were these discouraged, broken people in 519 BC. Remember who they were. Remember what the question was in verse 3 of chapter 7. Oh, do, do we stop the fast now? You know, the one we've been doing for 70 years in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes and weeping. Do we stop that now, God? It's amazing. As we look at the devastation of that city of Jerusalem, as we think of the brokenness and the hopelessness, so much so that they had forgotten who God was. Is that us today? As we look at our communities and our nation and our world. You see, they needed a servant of the Lord like Zechariah to remind them of who God was and why it mattered, or how they lived and what they did and why they should keep on building and why they should keep on trusting and why they should keep on believing and obeying the living God presented to us today now as the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, that's the preacher's role today in the life of the church. It's to motivate you to move from any ritual notions of fasting to an attitude of repentance and joy and serving. Friends, it may seem impossible for us today uh, and things may seem so unlikely just as it was then, but God is dealing with this world. Make no mistake. He's building his kingdom. But lastly, friends, Here's a question for our church that arises from this little question coming from Bethel all those years ago. And remember, it was a question that exposed their attitude to God, to their attitude to worship, to their attitude to obedience to his word. Here's our concluding question. Is NBC all about ritual today? Is that all we are? Or are we about real repentance and following Christ today? That's the question. You see, ritual takes a lot of effort. And you know, if I'm doing this service myself out of ritual, week after week, month after month, year after year, and if we're doing all of our ministries in this church out of a sense of ritual, well, guess what? We're going to get fed up. We're going to grow weary of it. And we won't be surprised when we see people giving up and maybe stopping attending church. It's because it's just some kind of religious act. But if our NBC family is serious about turning to the Lord from our sinfulness and repenting before him and gladly obeying him in all that we are and do, God is going to bless us. He is going to give us a foretaste of chapter 8. He's going to give us a picture of this great 
eternal blessing due to us when we see him at the end of history in glory. Ritual or repentance? Where are we at? May God help us to be people of repentance and glad obedience and service in his name. Amen.